Welcome, everyone, to the monthly International Ramana Maharshi Study Circle based here in San Diego, California. Michael James, as you can see, if you look for the person with the big beard, is joining us today. Uh, he's here the first Sunday of every um, month, and I think it's been about five years now since he's been with our San Diego group, and we're very grateful to have him, so thank you. And if anyone else would like to join us on, uh, from watching us on YouTube, you can do it by just emailing me your email address, and I'll be promptly putting you on our list. Uh, you can send it to me. My name is Ted, newsguy55 at aol.com, newsguy55 at aol.com. Michael, without further ado, how about, how about if we get started with the first question for you? Yes, yes. Right? Okay, it's from Diana. I don't see her here yet, but she may very well be joining us. Uh, she says, I see clarity, Michael, on Ramana Maharshi's teachings about desirelessness. Now, that's an interesting topic that we talk about from time to time. I've recently experienced inner turmoil on this subject, and I'm unsure if I've been practicing properly. I would appreciate your words on this, this topic. And then she goes on to say, it is my understanding that experiences, whether pleasurable or painful, occur quite naturally. As long as we do not actively pursue them, avoiding states of thinking, doing, or seeking, and remain in a state of I am, we align ourselves with Ramana's overall teachings. However, some followers avoid joyful things entirely, she says. Ramana said that things pulling us outside of self, outside of the state of oneness, are good practices for us. And he cautioned against renunciation. This leaves me with conflicting evidence on the path inward. And then she summarizes her question briefly by saying, Michael, could you clarify Ramana's teachings on desirelessness? Is it acceptable for experiences to occur naturally without actively seeking them? Or should they be completely avoided to better align themselves with Ramana's teachings? Intriguing question, Michael. Right. Um, <clears throat> regarding experiences, whatever we are given to experience is in accordance with prarabdha. Prarabdha means destiny or um, fate. That is, it, whatever we experience is the fruit of our past karmas, past actions we've done in previous births. But we have done uh, countless actions in previous birth, and so we're a countless fruit. Um, in each, as a general rule, in each lifetime, we accumulate more fruit than we experience. That is, in each lifetime, if we experience one lifetime worth of fruit, but we may accumulate 10 lifetimes worth of fruit. So the fruit of the actions we do in each life, uh, <clears throat> the fruit here means the moral consequences. So if we do good actions, we get to, it will give good fruit which we'll experience in the form of something pleasant. If we do bad actions, it will yield bad fruit, which we will experience in the form of something unpleasant. But we don't experience the fruit of actions immediately, though it may sometimes see if, seem if, but if we do a certain action, we experience a certain result. But actually, what whatever we are experiencing in this lifetime is not the result of the actions we do in this lifetime, but the result of actions from previous lifetimes. So each lifetime we are amassing more and more fruit, which are stored in what is called sanchitta. The word sanchitta simply means a heap or pile. So that is the store of the fruits of all the past karmas, but we haven't yet experienced. So in each lifetime, um, <clears throat> A certain a, a selection of the fruit of our past karmas are allotted for us to experience in this lifetime. They are allotted by God or Guru. In other words, Bhagavan allots the fruit of our past karmas. He does so in such a way that will be most conducive to our spiritual development. 
So whatever ex we are destined to experience in this life, we will experience. We cannot avoid it. So um, trying to avoid experiencing anything is futile. And trying to experience anything is futile because we cannot experience anything that we are not destined to experience. And we cannot avoid what we are destined to experience. Bhagavan made this very, very clear in the note he wrote for his mother. That is, in, that, in the note he wrote for his mother, what he said in the first sentence is, in accordance with the prarabdha of each one, he who is for that, being there, there, will cause to dance. What that literally, what, what that implies is, in order to experience all that we are destined to experience in this lifetime, certain actions of mind, speech or body are required on our part. Just to give a simple example, supposing we are destined to become a doctor or an engineer. In order to become a doctor or an engineer, we have to, we have to, we have to um, study, we have to pass exams, and we have to qualify ourselves. So since we are destined to be that, we will be made to go through those actions that are necessary in order to become a doctor or engineer or whatever it is. That's just an example. That's a major thing in life. It's, but the same is true for even for the smallest things in life. Whatever we are destined to experience, we will be made to act in accordance with that. For example, we may be a very, very careful driver, but if it's our destiny to have, a, um, have an accident, at just, the mo at just the wrong moment, we will be careless and the accident will happen. Like, like, so what, whatever is to happen in our life is going to happen and we, we will be made to act in accordance with that. That doesn't mean that all the actions we do are actions we're made to do. Um, oh, I, I'll just explain that sentence a little bit more. Um, he, he, Bhagavan uses a term in Tamil, Adakarnavan which literally means he who is for that. That is referring to God or Guru, the one whose, whose, uh, whose role or whose task it is to allot the fruit of uh, past karmas. So he who is for that, angangirindu means being there, there. That implies being in each place. But the deeper implication is being in the heart of each one of us. Atubipan literally means will cause to dance. Um, th that means we'll be made to act in, ac in accordance with, our, um, with whatever we are destined to experience in accordance with prarabdha. Um, <clears throat> but as, 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 as I was about to say, um, this doesn't mean that all the actions we do are actions we're made to do by God, because for all the actions we we did were actions we were made to do by God, we wouldn't be the doer, God would be the doer, so God would have to experience the fruit, we wouldn't have to experience the fruit, we experience the fruit because we are the doer of actions, because the majority of actions we do, we do under the sway of our vasanas. Vasanas means inclinations, it means volitional inclinations, the vasanas of a likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on, in their seed form. That is, desires begin as inclinations. Those inclinations give rise to likes or dislikes. The likes and dislikes give you rise to, uh, to desires and aversions. So they, they, these are just, they're all the same thing, but just different degrees of, uh, of subtlety. So in the desires in their subtlest form, are called vasanas or inclinations. Um, so we are constantly acting by mind, speech and body under the sway of our vasanas. So both the actions we do under the sway of our vasanas are the actions which bear fruit, which and the fruit, as I say, gets stored in Sanchitta from where God selects which fruit will be most beneficial for us to experience in this lifetime. So trying to avoid any experience 
is as futile as trying to experience anything because it's all already predetermined. We have no freedom. We can want to avoid, we can try to avoid. Or we can want to experience something, we can try to experience it, but we cannot experience it or avoid it. I mean, we can't experience it unless it's in our destiny. We cannot avoid it unless it's not in our destiny, in which case we need no, make no effort to avoid it because it's not going to happen anyway. So I've talked, I said the first sentence of a note Bhagavan wrote for his mother. Then in the uh, next sentence he says, what is never to happen will not happen in spite of any amount of effort. What he implies there is, though we cannot experience anything that we are not destined to experience, we can want to experience it and we can try to experience it. So we have that freedom, to, we, we are free to want whatever we want to want, and we are free also to try to experience it. But we are not free to experience it. We will experience it only if it is destined to happen. If it is not destined to happen, however much we want it, however much we try for it, it's not going to happen. So, as I say, in the second sentence, he says, what is never to happen will not happen uh, in spite of any amount of effort. Well, however much we try, we can translate it either way. Um, in the next sentence, he says the other side of the, I mean, the flip side of the same coin. Uh, what is to happen will not stop in spite of any amount of obstruction. So if we are destined to experience something, whether pleasant or unpleasant, we can try to avoid it. Uh, we, we, we can do everything. We, we, I mean, we can want to avoid it and we can do whatever we we we're able to do to avoid it, but we cannot avoid it because it is destined to happen. So trying to avoid experiences or trying to experience things is futile. But <clears throat> Bhagavan made this very clear. And oh, after that third sentence, he then says, Iduvetinam, uh, this indeed is certain. Very emphatically, he says, Ahalin, Monamai Irake Nandru. Therefore, being silent is best. Uh, <clears throat> what does he mean by being silent? Does he mean that we should just sit like a rock doing nothing? No, obviously not, because uh, we, we will be made to act in accordance with our destiny. So being silent doesn't mean doing nothing. Being silent means not rising as ego, the doer of actions. That is, the actions will go on in accordance with prarabdha. We shouldn't rise as ego. That is, when we rise as ego, we experience ourselves as this bundle called body. Uh, that is, it's often described as a bundle of five sheaths. The, the physical form of the body, the life that animates the body, the prana, the mind, uh, or manamaya kosha that uh, functions within the body, the intellect and the will. So these five are collectively referred, Bhagavan collectively referred to these five as body. So long as we experience ourselves with this body, any actions, physical actions or uh, vocal actions or mental actions are experienced by us as I am doing this. I am sitting, I am walking, I am running, I am driving, I am this, I am that. We, I think because we, I, we experience the body as I, the actions that the body does are experienced by us as actions that we are doing. Um, likewise with speech, I am talking, I am speaking. Because we, we, because we identify ourselves with this bundle of five sheaves, when, we, when, this, when this person who, who is constituted by these five sheaves speaks, we experience it as I am speaking. Likewise with uh, mental actions, I am thinking, I am, uh, I am perceiving, I am, um, I am uh, feeling happy, I'm feeling unhappy, etc., etc., or whatever, what, any, we, because we identify ourselves with these instruments of action, whatever actions are done are experienced by us as I am doing these things. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, when Bhagavan says being silent is uh, uh, is good, um, what he implies is not rising as ego and thereby identifying ourselves with these 
instruments of action. The actions will go on in accordance with destiny. We shouldn't rise as ego to identify ourselves as I am this person who is, who is sitting here talking and thinking of what to say next. Um, so it's a, a matter of giving up the doership. But um, coming back to a main question about what is desirelessness, Bhagavan has given a very clear and simple definition of desirelessness. In the 11th paragraph of, um, of Nana, what he says is, um, uh, Anyate nada dirital veragium aladunirase. Anyate, anyam means what is other. Um, Anyate is, is, is an accusative form of that, so that's the object, what is other. Nada dirital means not attending to, or not, seek, not seeking or not attending to what is other. Anything other attending to anything other than ourselves, is, is, we attend to things other than ourselves under the sway of our vasanas, which are the seeds, which are the desires in their seed form. So not attending to anything other than ourselves, that is veragya or nirasa. Uh, nirasa asa means um, a desire. Nirasa means desirelessness, literally. Vairagyam uh, means, means more or less the same. Vairag, uh, raga is, um, means passion. Viraga is freedom from passion. And uh, Vairagya is, uh, is, uh, um, is um, the state of being free of, of, of passion. Passion means desire. So, Vairagya and Nirasa both mean the same, but he uses both words here. So, not attending to what is other is Vairagya or, uh, or desirelessness, or Nirasa. Um, what is other means anything other than ourself. So, uh, the state in which we do not attend to anything other than ourself is a state of desirelessness. But if we simply give up attending to anything other than ourselves, what will happen? We will fall asleep or in, we will subside into a state of manolaya. Manolaya means a, a temporary dissolution of, um, of, of mind. Every night when we are, uh, uh, when we, at the end of the day, we are tired. We're too tired to continue thinking. We're too tired to continue attending to things other than ourselves. So we give up attending to anything other than ourselves. We give up thinking, and as a result, we subside in, in sleep, which is a, a temporary dissolution of mind. But because the mind is not destroyed, though it doesn't exist in sleep, it hasn't been destroyed, so it will rise again. Um, so uh, when Bhagavan says um, that not attending to anything other than ourselves is vairagya, he, he doesn't imply that we should perpetually uh, sleep, because we cannot perpetually sleep. But because uh, uh, so long as desire is there, we will continue rising as ego. So um, in the next sentence, he says, the, other, the flip side of the same coin, tanne vidā dirital jñānam, not uh, leaving oneself or not letting go of oneself is jñāna. Jnana means uh, the, the, real, the pure awareness or real knowledge. So not letting go of ourselves means not ceasing to attend to ourselves is jnana. And then he says, unmail irendu irendum andre. Uh, that means in truth both are one. So desirelessness and jnana are one and the same. That state in which we attend to nothing other than ourselves. That is the state of desirelessness. That is the state of jnana. So, if we if we grasp this, all this all, all the confusion that uh, uh, Diana is uh, is talking about, it will it will dissolve. Um, so I'll just go through her question. Uh, uh, sentence by sentence, just to answer. He, she begins by saying she seeks clarity on Bhagavan's teachings about desirelessness, and she's experienced inner turmoil on this subject. 
because she's not sure if she's practicing properly. Then she goes on to say, it is my understanding that experiences, whether pleasurable or painful, occur naturally. I wouldn't say they occur naturally, but I, I understand what she means. What she means is, but well, yes, they do. They occur according to destiny. So um, I think that's what she means by occurring naturally. But it's not actually natural. Experiencing anything other than ourself is an unnatural state. It's natural for ego, but it's unnatural for us. That is, it's contrary to our real nature. Because our real nature, what we actually are, is pure awareness, which means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. But so long as we rise as ego, we inevitably will experience things other than ourselves. So in that sense, it's natural. Um, and then she says, as long as we do not actively pursue them, avoiding states of thinking, doing, seeking, and remain in a state of I am I, we align with his teachings. Um, we need not actually avoid anything. We need not try to avoid thinking or doing or seeking. All we need to do is to attend to ourselves, Because to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to our own being, to what we actually are, to that extent, we will be, withdraw we will be with uh, withdrawing our attention from all other things. So thinking, doing and seeking will automatically cease if we attend only to ourself. Uh, so the important thing is attending to ourself. Because if we merely try to avoid thinking or doing or seeking, what will happen? We'll, we'll fall asleep or subside into some other state of mana layer. We may get experience Nivikalpa Samadhi, but it's still only a temporary dissolution of mind. So our aim is not to avoid thinking, not to avoid doing, not to avoid seeking. Our aim is to attend only to ourself. If we attend only to ourself, the cessation of thinking, doing and seeking will, hap will happen automatically. Um, uh, but so long as we're attending to ourselves, we won't subside in Manolaya. So, uh, that is, if we subside in Manolaya, that, that is, when we're attending to ourselves, we can lose our hold on self-attentiveness in one of two ways. Either we can be distracted by other thoughts and begin attending to things other than ourselves, or we can uh, we can fall asleep. Um, but uh, both of these are the result of uh, losing our hold on self-attentiveness. So long as we hold on to self-attentiveness, we um, we 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 cannot uh, sub we cannot fall asleep and we cannot get carried away by thoughts. That's why Bhagavan, what Bhagavan meant by tanne vidā dirital jñānam. Not letting go of oneself is jñāna. And that is the same as vairāgya, which is not attending to anything other than ourself. So Bhagavan's, uh, Bhagavan's teaching, Bhagavan never asked us to try and stop thinking or stop doing or anything. He simply said, attend to yourself. If to the extent to which we attend to ourselves. To that extent, thinking, doing, and seeking will automatically cease. Um, and then she goes on to say, however, some followers avoid joyful things entirely. Well, if they can, they may want to try and avoid joyful things entirely, but if it's their destiny, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, if it's destined, it will be experienced by us. That is, some people take this to be fatalism. It is not fatalism. Because if we are if we are following this path of self-investigation and self-surrender that Bhagavan taught us, whatever joyful experiences or painful experiences come and go will not affect us. Because we are, that is, we are affected by the joys and sorrows of life to the extent to which our mind is outward going and we are attached to these things. But to the extent to which we direct our mind back within, though the, the joys and sorrows of life, I mean, in, 
for all of us, life is is uh, a mixture of joys and sorrows. We all undergo, uh, we all have undergo unpleasant experiences. We all undergo pleasant experiences. That's just the nature of embodied existence. That is samsara. But the the extent to which we are affected by those joys and sorrows of life depends on how attached we are to the this external life, this life of our uh, life as a person. If I'm very strongly identified with this person I take myself to be, if I am Michael, and Michael is all important, then the joys of sorrows and sorrows of life will affect me. But if I'm if I'm trying to cling to my own being, the joys and sorrows of life won't affect me because whether I'm in a joyful state or a miserable state, the my, I am. That is, without, I, with, without being, we cannot experience either joy or sorrow. So if we're holding on to our being, the joys and sorrows will not affect us. So we don't have to avoid anything. Let, whatever is to happen according to destiny, let it happen. We just shouldn't be affected by it. And we can avoid being affected by it only by holding on to our own being. And then she says, Ramana said that, Things pulling us outside our state of oneness are good practice. I'm not quite sure what she meant by what she means by this. That is, being pulled outside is not a good practice. But but I think what she's maybe referring to is that anything that tries to pull us out, it's a good opportunity for us to practice holding on to our being. Because if we don't allow ourselves to be pulled outside, those things that tend to pull us outside, namely our own vasanas, our own inclinations, desires, they will lose their strength to the extent to which we hold on to our being. That is, the nature of vasanas is such that they are strengthened to the extent to which we allow ourselves to be swayed by them. And they are weakened to the extent to which we refrain from being swayed by them. We can see this in, for, for example, just to give a, a simple example, supposing, supposing someone has a, um, is a smoker, they may want to give up smoking, but because they've been indulging that inclination to smoke for so long, it's a very strong inclination. But there's only one way to overcome that inclination. If they continue indulging that inclination, it'll continue getting stronger and stronger. But if they decide, no, smoking is not good for me, it's bad for my health, and it also affects others around me, so I should give up smoking. If, we, if, they, if they make such a, a, a firm decision, and if they stick to that decision, whenever the inclination to smoke arises, they don't allow themselves to be swayed by that inclination then the inclination will become weaker and weaker and weaker. So this is, this is true of all inclinations. So all the inclinations that pull us outwards are what Bhagavan referred to as vishaya vasanas. Vishaya means objects or phenomena. So anything other than ourself is a vishaya. So the inclination to seek happiness in anything other than ourself, the inclination to attend to anything other than ourself is a vishaya vasana. These vishaya vasanas, the, the, oh, the opposite of vishaya vasana is sat vasana. Sat means being. So sat vasana is the inclination to hold on to our being and thereby to be as we actually are. Because to the extent to which we attend to our being, we thereby subside and dissolve back into our being. So by the practice of self-investigation, by trying more and more to attend to ourself, we are strengthening the sattvasana and we are weakening the vishayavasanas. Because every time we attend to ourself, we are refraining from being swayed by the vishayavasanas, which take our attention away from ourself. So, so many things happen that but um, but in life, but um, kindle our vasanas and make us feel inclined to attend to things other than ourselves. Maybe we're in some financial difficulty or some relationship difficulty or some emotional difficulty. So many things are there. It's easy to let the mind dwell on these things. 
but rather, but by letting the mind dwell on these things, we can't solve these problems. So the best thing is to turn our attention back within. If we refrain from being pulled outwards by these external circumstances, that is a good practice. So it's a, I think what she means by a good practice, it's a good opportunity for us to practice. <clears throat> and then she says, and he cautioned against renunciation. This is not correct, but we need to understand what renunciation is. That is, generally when people talk about renunciation, they think about external renunciation. So, for example, becoming a sannyasi, uh, gi giving up, uh, giving up um, uh, worldly life, trying to live a, a life of a renunciate, that is what people generally take as renunciation. Bhagavan never either encouraged or discouraged anyone from taking sannyasa. If people asked him, he said it's not necessary. There's, in the first chapter of Maharshi's Gospel, there's, a, um, there's a, a, a dialogue recorded where someone asked Bhagavan, should I renounce? Bhagavan says, no, it's not necessary. When they say, should I renounce, they mean the external uh, the, 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 renounce outwardly. Bhagavan said it, it's not necessary. They, then the person asked, then why did you renounce? And Bhagavan said, that was my destiny. If it were your destiny, you wouldn't be asking this question. The very fact that people, if we ask the question, that means it's not meant to be. If, we, if it's meant to be, it will happen. So Bhagavan said on many occasions, just like marriage comes according to destiny, uh, sannyasa also comes according to destiny. So if it's our destiny to be a sannyasi, we will be a sannyasi, we can't avoid it. If it's our destiny to be married and to have 10 children and to have so many responsibilities, it will happen. But whatever happens, it's all according to prarabdha. And whatever is allotted in our prarabdha is what is spiritually beneficial for us. So we should know that that is having lots of responsibilities, seeming outward responsibilities, is not an obstacle to following this spiritual path. Because if we, it's a, whatever is outward responsibilities we have, they're only seeming responsibilities in the sense that if it's, supposing we've got a, we, we're married with 10 children, obviously that's a big responsibility. We've got to, we've got to feed the children we may have to earn, or if our, if our husband or wife is earning, we may, maybe we have to have two children, whatever it is. It's a big responsibility to have 10 children. But if it's our destiny to have 10 children, and if it's the destiny of those children to have a, uh, to be well taken care of by their parents, it will all happen as it's meant to happen. So we shouldn't identify ourselves as uh, I, I have 10 children, I have this big responsibility. We shouldn't, we should just, uh, it, that is it, the wrong identification is the obstacle. Bhagavan often said, if you, if you renounce your, your how, uh, in India generally, the, the, the state of being married with children is referred to as a grahasta ashrama. That literally means a householder life. So if you, if you're, if you, renounce the householder life and become a sannyasi, you're just giving up one identification and taking on another identification. Formerly you felt, I am a householder, I have many responsibilities. Now you have the, um, the, the, the identification, I am a sannyasi, I am dedicated to spiritual path. It's all a false identification. That, that, so true, Bhagavan made it clear, true renunciation, that is this outward renunciation will come a, or not come according to destiny. But that is not the true renunciation. The true renunciation is inward renunciation. And Bhagavan uh, made it clear um, in many occasions, but particularly in verse 26 of Uludu Napadu, he, he explains what is true renunciation. What he says in that verse is, Ahande yundain anate mundahum. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. A hundred in drail, indruanatum. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. 
um, I'll just pause there and I'll explain that. Why does he say that? What he means by everything there is all phenomena. Phenomena, all phenomena appear only in the view of ego. Only when we rise as ego do we experience phenomena. We can see this from our own experience. In waking a dream, we rise as ego, identify ourselves as a body, and experience so many phenomena. In sleep, we, we cease rising as ego, so we're not aware of anything other than ourselves. So, all phenomena appear only in the view of ego. And as Bhagavan made it clear, this waking state is just another dream. So as soon as we start dreaming, we, we, uh, we, we experience ourselves as a dream body in a dream world, and it all seems very real so long as we're dreaming. In, in exactly the same way, all this is just a dream. It all exists only in our view. So that's why he says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. In other words, ego is the root of everything. And then in the next sentence he says, Ahandeya Yavamam, ego itself is everything. That is, when we are dreaming, we are seeing ourselves as the dream world. That is, whatever we are, though we're in, while we are dreaming, because we identify ourselves with a dream body, the rest of the dream world seems to be outside ourselves. But actually, everything that we experience in that dream is nothing but ourself. It, we are seeing ourself as the dream world. So that's why Bhagavan says, ego itself is everything. That is, all phenomena, are, 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 those phenomena have no existence independent of ego. So as ego, we see ourselves as all these phenomena. But then the important sentence that I wanted to refer to is the final sentence of that verse. He then says, Adalal Yaduidu Endru Nadale Ovidal Yavamena Or. Therefore, know that investigating what this is is giving up everything. This here refers to ego. So investigating ego is giving up everything. Why, why do, he says therefore, so there's a logical connection, but what, there's one thing that is not explicitly stated in this verse, but was explicitly stated in the previous verse. That is, the nature of ego is to subside to the extent to which it attends to itself. That is, we seem to be ego only so long as we're attending to other things. If we turn our attention back to ourselves, to see who am I this ego, there's no such thing as ego to be found. That's why in the previous verse he said, if seeking it takes flight. That means if ego seeks its own reality, it disappears. It, because the ego isn't real. It seems to be real only because we're attending to things other than ourselves. But if we turn our attention back to see who am I, there's no such thing as ego to be found. All that is to be found ultimately is pure satchit, pure being awareness, which is what we actually are. So if we investigate ego, ego will cease to exist. That is, ego will subside and dissolve back into its source, into its own being. And when ego subsides, everything else will subside along with it. So for Bhagavan, Bhagavan made it clear the true renunciation isn't just this outward form of renunciation, but the true renunciation is the inward renunciation. And that inward renunciation can be achieved only by self-investigation. So by self-investigation, we are surrendering ourselves completely and giving up everything. So this, is the, this path of self-investigation is itself the, uh, the, the ultimate path of renunciation. So renunciation is at the very heart of Bhagavan's teachings, but Bhagavan doesn't attach importance to this outward renunciation. Bhagavan said, if, and it's, what's for you, if you, if you, oh, one thing he said was, the, the householder, that the family person, who doesn't feel I am a householder, is a better sannyasi than the sannyasi who feels I am a sannyasi. 
So Bhagavan makes it clear, it's the identification is the problem. So merely changing your identification from being from one type of lifestyle to another life type of lifestyle, that is not the true renunciation. The true renunciation is only turning within and merging back into our own being. That is the path of self-investigation. Um, and then she goes on to say, uh, this leaves me with conflicting evidence on the path, because p many people don't understand Bhagavan's teachings, so they, they, they with their half baked understanding, they jump to conclusions. And this uh, naturally creates uh, confusion and conflict. But if we attend to what Bhagavan actually says in his own original writings, his teachings are very, very clear. There's no room for any, um, any confusion. So the conflicting evidence is only from coming from those who haven't understood his teachings correctly. If people understand his teachings correctly, it's very, very clear and very, very simple. And then she asks, um, could you clarify Ramana Maharshi's teachings on desirelessness? Well, I hope I've done so. Is it acceptable for experiences to occur naturally without actively seeking them, or should they be completely avoided to align with his teachings? Trying to avoid anything or trying to seek any, anything other than ourselves, both are contrary to his teachings, because what is going to happen outwardly, it's going to happen according to destiny. So we should, we should not be interested in the outward life. We should be interested in one thing and one thing alone. Who am I? That is the true desirelessness. That is the true renunciation. Diana's here. If you'd like to ask her a question, if she understands all your answers, which have been okay. very good. Diane, Diana, was that a clear answer? Yes, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. I hope it's removed the, the conflicting, I mean, I hope that <laughs> removes all the conflicting evidence that you came across before, but was creating okay. confusion. Yeah, I really appreciate you going over everything. That was so beautiful. Okay, good. We wrote a couple of chat thank yous for that. Before we move on to the next question, Michael, a real quick follow-up to something you said maybe 20 minutes ago. We are free to want whatever we want. Are we free to want? Are we free to ask for self-realization? That is, we, it, we want what we want. <laughs> but the... But wanting self-realization is quite different to wanting anything else. If I want to have um, um, a newer car, a latest iPhone, uh, a bigger house, um, uh, more friends, more likes on Facebook or whatever it is, uh, these are all wants because we're wanting something, but we don't have, we, we, we are desiring to acquire more. But self-realization isn't acquiring anything. Self-realization, as Bhagavan said, investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. So self-realization is not, is not acquiring anything, it's losing everything. So the desire to lose everything is not a desire. That is the love to be as we actually are. So short of losing my head, <laughs> I can... I can I can discover the self realization I've always had. I've never been without it. That's what you're saying. It, it's our real Bhagavan often said, if jnana were a new knowledge to be attained, it would be lost one day, because whatever comes will go. It's the nature of things. So, jnana is eternal. Moksha mukti is eternal. It's our real nature. Even now we are liberated. Even now we are self-realized, but we don't know it because we have, we have falsely identify ourselves with this body. If we turn our attention back within, we'll find this false identification will dissolve, and then we will see that we were ever liberated. We eternally self-realized. What is self-realization? Knowing ourselves. Who is there who doesn't know themselves? Everyone knows I am. The problem is. I am is the truth, but the problem is we don't know just I am. We know I am Ted, I am Michael, 
I am Diane, I am this person, I am that person. That is that false identification is what makes us seem to be something other than what we actually are. So what is called self-realization is just the removal of that um, false identification. Bhagavan used to joke about the English word realization. Bhagavan said, what is real is always real. It doesn't need to be realized. The problem is that we have realized the unreal. So all that is required is for us to unrealize the unreal and the real alone will remain. Unrealizing the unreal means giving up the false identification. I am this or that. When we give up that false identification, what remains is just I am. That alone is what is eternally real. Thank you, Michael. I ask that only because I, I know myself a little bit and I always need to be reminded of the truth of who I am. And you just did it again. Thank you. We're going on now to a question submitted by Anonymous. Uh, I don't see Anonymous here, so I don't know to be, and I don't think that person would want to speak up. Um, so I'll just read the question and hear your answer. And it's a very intriguing question to me. That person says, if possible, can you ask Michael if he has any information as to why the Brahmin priests chant Sri Shuktam every day at Ramana's ashram? I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Any insights as to why Ramana or how it came to be that he would have this particular chant, which is a prayer requesting financial wealth and the birth of sons and so forth, and nothing to do with manonasa or surrounding ego to God, surrendering ego to God, manonasa. I, I kind of bungled that question, but I think you've got it there. Yeah, yeah, Richard. yeah. Well, um, probably the, the best people to ask this question would be the priests at Ramanashram, the Brahmins at Ramanashram, why they chant this? Because I'm not the one who chants it, it's them who chants it. But I guess if you ask them, they probably won't know. They'll say, this is, because what we, this is what we're here for, this is what we're paid for, this is our job, we're, we're reciting this. But I think the question is, how, this, how it came to be that the, all these things are chanted there? I, I didn't know about three... Sri Suktam, uh, that's a, a one Vedic chant. Uh, I didn't know that they chanted that, but one thing I do know is they do um, Rudram, Sri Rudram. Rudram is a Vedic, um, a Vedic hymn that consists of two parts. One part is Chamakam and the other part is Namakam. Namakam is just a uh, Rudram means Shiva. It's a, it's a hymn supposedly in praise of Shiva. So the Namakam is doing um, obeisance to Shiva. That's fine. There's no problem with that. The problem is with the Chamakam. Chamakam is called Chamakam because of the, the words Chame uh, 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 are, repeat, are repeated again and again and again. Cha means and. May means to me. So basically, it's a long shopping list of what um, of the things that made a good life in the Vedic times. So it was uh, things like cows to me, sons to me, this to me, that to me, and this to me, and this to me, and this to me, and that to me. It's a long, long, it's a pure, pure undiluted kamyata. And this Sri Suktam, I think, is a similar thing. Most of the Vedas, that is, the, the Vedas, um, the Vedas are, actually, they consist of four parts. That is not the four Vedas, but each of the four Vedas consists of four parts. Um, there's the, um, let me remember if I, I um, it uh, begins with the, um, um, the, um, I've forgotten what it's called, uh, things like Purusha Suktam. They're, they're just hymns to the various Vedic gods. Then there's the, um, the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas are all about the, are the instructions how to do rituals, how to do yagas, yagnas, all these things. Then there's the Aranyakas, 
which are uh, about um, the, the Brahmanas are about the external type of uh, of, uh, of karmas, the, of doing the yagas, the yagnas, these are the sacri fire sacrifices. The aranyakas are about the internal, it's about upasana. That's um, instead of outwardly doing these rituals, inwardly doing the ritual. I mean, meditating on those Vedic gods. So all these first three parts of the Vedas, these all belong to what is called karma kanda. Uh, there is the, it's the action portion of the Vedas. And they are all, the actions are for dis achieving a certain result. So all these yagas, yagnas and things, it's for achieving results for achieving a good life in this world and a good life and, and a promotion in the next life to going to heaven or wherever. That's what it's all about. The fourth part of the Vedas is the Upanishads. That is what is called Vedanta. And if you read the Upanishads, you will find a lot of criticism in the Upanishads of the of all these Vedic rituals, because the Vedic rituals are all about uh, it's all kar, kar, karmia, uh, kar, karmia karmas, that is, actions done for the fulfillment of desires. So, um, Bhagavan's opinion on these is made very, very clear in Upadesha India. That is, Murugana was, um, was in Ramana Sandhimurai, he was composed, he sang so many hymns in praise of Bhagavan. In one of those, uh, one of the songs he was singing was Tiruvundiya, in which he was telling many, many divine leelas. He was telling the story of, of Rama, of Krishna, of uh, Subramani, all these different gods and various incidents in their lives. And he was saying, because for Murugana, Bhagavan is, it's Bhagavan who appeared as Rama, it's Bhagavan who appeared as Krishna, it's Bhagavan who appears as Subramanya, Bhagavan who appears as Shiva. That is all his own, for Murugana, every, all gods are only Bhagavan. It's Bhagavan in different forms, but it's all Bhagavan. So he was, he was composing with him. And one of the Shiva Leelas, one of the stories of Shiva that he was telling, was the story of the Darakavana Rishis. These so-called Rishis, they were, they were Paka uh, Karmakandis. They, they were doing rituals in order to acquire, um, for the fulfillment of their desires, to g gain power, to enjoy this life, and uh, believing that uh, by the power of their karmas, they would also have a better life, uh, go to heaven and whatever. All, all, so that was what they were all about. And they, they were basically followers of what later came to be called the Purva Mimamsa philosophy. The Purva, according to the Purva Mimamsa philosophy, which is the philosophy for interpreting all this karma kanda of the Vedas, very literally, and taking all these act, all these, um, it's, 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 uh, Mimamsa means the interpret, uh, uh, I don't know, if you can't remember the exact meaning of Mimamsa, but it more or less means the interpretation of the Ved, of that older portion of the Vedas. So, according to Purva Mimamsa, there is no God except karma. That is, even if there are higher gods, they attain that position by doing karmas. So, karma is the ultimate, um, the ultimate power. Um, so, Murugana was writing this story, and in one of the verses he wrote, um, the attitude of these rishis, Karma te yandri kadavalilayennam. That is, there, there's no God except karma. We're going to put it explicitly. And later, when Bhagavan wrote to Pradesh India, he selected some of the verses of Murugana as a lopogatam, just as a brief introduction to the summarizing the story. He, Bhagavan selected that particular verse among the other six verses. That verse where, because that clearly states what was the where were, where were these rishis going wrong? Because they had so much faith in karma, they thought karma is above God. So, um, according to the story, in order to vanquish their pride, Lord Shiva came in the form of a mendicant into the forest, and he was accompanied by Vishnu in the form of uh, Mohini. That is, Vishnu often takes on a female form of Mohini. And she's a very, very beautiful, very attractive 
a lady. That's why she's called Mohini. She, she, she would delude the mind of men. So when the Rishis saw this Mohini, they were overcome with lust and they started to follow her. And uh, so she, she, the Mohini led them away and then Mohini disappeared. In the meanwhile, Lord Shiva came as a naked mendicant, a young, a young uh, boy, a, a young man, uh, wandering naked in the forest. When the wives of the Rishis saw this uh, mendicant, they saw his divine luster. And so they started being attracted by this, his obvious divinity. They started to follow him. The sages uh, who had lost Mohini, couldn't find Mohini, they were coming back, the, these rishis. And when they saw their wives following this uh, naked young man, they, because their minds were overcome with lust when they saw Mohini, they thought their wives were overcome with lust. But that wasn't the case. Actually, their wives were more elevated than the husbands because the wives were were not seeking anything. They were just selflessly serving their husband. So their minds were purer than the, the husband's mind. So they, why they were attracted to Lord Shiva was not because of his nakedness, but because of his, um, because of his divine luster. So when they saw their wives following this mendicant, they became very angry and they started a very powerful yaga, which could, from which all sorts of weapons came out. Um, uh, an elephant came out and charged at the mendicant, and Lord Shiva effortlessly uh, slayed him and wore his, uh, the skin of the elephant. And um, they, uh, a trident came. He took it, that trident for himself. So whatever weapons they, they set upon him, a tiger came. He also uh, killed the tiger. All, what all this means, that he, what he was demonstrating is Karmas cannot give fruit, except by the, uh, it's only God who gives the fruit of karma. Karmas don't give their own fruit. So all these powerful karmas, which these rishis had so much faith in, were shown by Lord Shiva to be powerless. Then only their pride was vanquished. So they came and they fell at the feet of Lord Shiva and, and prayed for uh, uh, guidance. What is the proper path? Then... At that point, when Murugana came to the point where Lord Shiva is to give Upadesha, to give the teachings to these rishis, um, he, he then asked Bhagavan, Bhagavan, you should write this Upadesha, because Bhagavan is Shiva himself. He alone is the one qualified to write the Upadesha. So Bhagavan wrote this 30 verses of Upadesha India. And in the first verse, he repudiates the whole philosophy of Purva Mimamsa by saying, Karma giving fruit is by the ordainment of God. It, uh, it, um, uh, uh, karma payandal kartana dharmayal karma kadavala undipara is karma God. Karma is jada, karma jadamadal. It, since karma is, is insentient, it cannot be God, is the implication. So, karmas cannot give fruit except by the ordainment of God. That is, as Krishna says in the Gita, you have the right to the action, but not to the fruit thereof. We're free to do whatever we want, but the fruit of those actions, that's in God's hands. Once, you, once, you, once you've done the action, you no longer have any, um, any adhikaram, any right over those fruit. You will be given those fruit to experience at the proper time, according to the will of God. That's the idea. So we can clearly see from Upadesha India, but Bhagavan is, is, is repudiating, and from the whole story and context, Bhagavan is, 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 is pointing out the futility of all this, uh, this karmia karmas. And then in um, the second verse of Upadesha India, he says, the fruit of karma passing away. That is, the, um, in Sanskrit, he said, palama saswatam, the fruit of karma is, is impermanent. Because any action you do, when you're given to experience the fruit of that action, as soon as you've experienced the fruit of that action, that fruit is finished. Just like a physical fruit. If you're given a, a, an apple to eat, if you eat the apple, 
You can't eat it again after eating it, but once it's eaten, it's finished. Like that, the fruit of karma. When you, when you experience the fruit of a karma, it's finished. So uh, doing action for the sake of fruit is futile, because whatever fruit you experience, it's going to just pass away. It's, it's impermanent. But the problem with karma is there are two types of results of karma. Just like a, um, a, any edible fruit has the edible portion and it has the seed. The seeds that, in the, uh, of, that, uh, uh, the seeds that are cultivated by karma are called vasanas. And those seeds are what cause us to fall in the great ocean of action. Therefore, action does not give liberation. So Bhagavan makes it very clear all these karmiya karmas are futile. They're just going to, they're just self-perpetuate, I mean, they're just drowning us more and more in the ocean of action. So in the third verse, he then says, action, the nishkarmiya karma, that means action done without desire, but done only for God, that means done for the love of God, will purify the mind and show the way to liberation. And then he goes on. So Bhagavan is, is, has made it very clear this karmiya karmas is, 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 cannot be a means to liberation. It, in, in the Sanskrit version of verse 2, he says, gati nirodakam, it, it obstructs liberation. So all these um, all these Vedic chanting in the ashram had nothing to do with Bhagavan's teachings. How this came about, um, well, I've heard various stories, but the, the, what, what I gathered generally from old devotees who were there at the time, in the early 1930s, that, that is in the 1920s, there were a series of managers of the ashram. Generally, they were self-appointed managers, and they, um, the first one was Perumal Swami, who, who made himself very unpopular by trying to boss over everyone. That was up in Skandashram. So long as Bhagavan was living in Burupakshi Cave, he was just living as a beggar. Uh, and other beggars came and joined him. That is, sadhus are beggars. They are mendicants. They live on arms. So then there were no problems. It was only once it... More visitors started coming, and Skandashram was built, and later Ramanashram was built at the foot of the hill. And managers, um, uh, well, when, when you have an institution, there'll always be, have to be someone who manages it. So anyway, there were a lot of different managers in the 1920s, but eventually, in the early 1930s, Bhagavan's younger brother, Chinnaswamy, became the manager. And Bhagavan's younger brother was very, very devoted to his mother. So one of his ambitions was to build a temple over his mother's samadhi. And, and Bhagavan had also clearly indicated that his mother had attained liberation at the last minute. So Chinnaswami had this ambition to build this temple. And so he, he, he wanted to do things in the best possible way. So people um, some people advised him, but if, if in order to build a temple, you need to have uh, um, you need to have all these Vedic rituals and everything are necessary. So um, he was somehow persuaded. But having if he if um, if Vedic priests are employed to chant the Vedas, that will be good for building the temple. So from about the mid 1930s, this Veda Parayana started. And it had nothing to do with Bhagavan, but whatever happens, Bhagavan is least bothered about these things. So this Veda Parayana has nothing to do with Bhagavan or his teachings. The only thing they chant which has anything to do with Bhagavan's teachings is Nakarmana. That means not by, um, uh, not by action, not by progeny, not by this, not by that, is liberation attained, only by renunciation. Um, so that's that. That's uh, from I think that's uh, from the, um, one of the minor Upanishads, from the Kaivalya Upanishad, I believe that comes. Um, so that's the only thing that is in tune with Bhagavan's teachings. The rest of it has very little to do with Bhagavan's teachings in any way at all. Much of it is quite quite contrary to Bhagavan's teachings. But Bhagavan is least bothered about these things. So 
these have no connection with Bhagavan teaching. Another thing that goes on in Ramanasham is this uh, Sri Chakra Puja. That is, when the temple was being built, some people advised Chinnaswami that in order to give power to this temple, he should install a Sri Chakra. A Sri Chakra is a tantric... Um, uh, a sh um, uh, it's, a, it's called a yantra, it's a, it's a, sim it's a, it's a tantric uh, uh, symbol that represents um, Devi, and it's supposed to be full of power. And they said, if you install this, this will be very good for the temple. That actually wasn't very good advice, because the, the reason three chakras are installed in some temples is in order to give power to that temple. But Bhagavan clearly stated that his mother had attained liberation. So it's the temple built over the Samadhi of Anjani. There's no power in this world higher than Jnana. So there's no need for bringing in some other power to give it power, because the power is already there. I mean, Jnana is the, is the, is the source of all power. Um, that is, the, the jnana is chit shakti, the power, of, uh, the, the ultimate power. So you don't need all these three chakras. But anyway, Chinnaswami was advised and it was installed. And then at the time of uh, Kumbhavishekam, they did the first three chakra puja. And they asked Bhagavan to come and attend. And, oh, there's a long story to it. And um, afterwards, when the priest said to Bhagavan, oh, wasn't it glorious? Um, Bhagavan just, um, I mean, what, what can Bhagavan say? He just sort of nodded his head and they said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we have this, um, if we have this every week? Then Bhagavan said, who will take it on their head? That means who will be bothered with all this? But Chadwick, who was there, asked, what did Bhagavan say? And someone said, we, we said to Bhagavan, wouldn't it be wonderful if we have this every week? And... Um, and the Bhagavan said, who will take responsibility for it? Chadwick said, I'll take responsibility for it, because he didn't understand the spirit in which Bhagavan said that. When Bhagavan said, who will take it on his head? It means who will be bothered with all these things, indicating that this is unnecessary. But Chadwick misunderstood. So, but Chadwick was a good devotee. He, he, he did it genuinely believing that is good. So. They actually didn't do any more Sri Chakra Pujas during Bhagavan's lifetime because uh, Bhagavan was already sick with uh, cancer and uh, nobody thought about it again. But after some years, someone reminded Chadwick, you promised Bhagavan that you would take responsibility for this. So then Chadwick took on responsibility for the Veda Patasala, the Veda, the, the, um, it, continuing to run this school for Veda, the, the young boys who are learning to um, all this uh, chanting of the Vedas and everything, and for the Sri Chakra Puja. And so since that time, since the, um, about the mid-1950s, this Sri Chakra Puja they've been doing, I think they do it once a month or something, I, I can't remember, there's a particular day on a Friday they do the Sri Chakra Puja. But Sri Chakra, why people do Sri Chakra Puja? It's for this, it's for um, it's it, what uh, this anonymous person says, it's requesting financial, whatever it is, financial wealth, birth of sons, marriage of daughters, all, I mean, it's whatever you want to pray for, if you want anything, if you do, if you, if you um, pay for this Sri Chakra Puja to be done, people believe that your desires will be fulfilled. So it's only for the fulfillment of desire. None of this has anything to do with Bhagavan's teachings. Bhagavan's teachings, as, as I was saying earlier, Bhagavan's teachings are all about desirelessness and renunciation. This is this, uh, this, uh, the karma khandra of the Vedas and much of the tantric forms of worship, like the Sri Chakra, are going, Sri Chakra Upasana, are going in, a, are going in the diametrically opposite direction. Bhagavan's teaching is the path of nibriti, the path of withdrawal back into the source. All these other things, this, uh, this karmakanda of the Vedas, this, um, the, a lot of this tantric upasana, not all of it, tantric upasana can be for genuine devotion, but a lot of it is it's, it's kamyata, so it's 
depravity. It's going outward going. So just because things happen in Raman Ashram doesn't mean it's it's because of Bhagavan. It's that is truly speaking, the ashram was built by the devotees for the devotees. Bhagavan didn't need any ashram. Bhagavan was very happy living in a cave on the hill. But um because he was Bhagavan, all sorts of people came and when people particularly when um prosperous people come, they want somewhere nice to stay. They don't want to uh, just uh, um, sleep on the floor of the cave and live on begged food as they were living in in the early days on the hill up to nearly 19 well and really it, the cooking started in um, started only after Bhagavan's mother came in about uh, 1916 I think it's yes 1916 so that's when cooking started. And when cooking started, one thing led to another thing, led to another thing. And finally, it became a big ashram. And now it's a, it's a, a wealthy institution. Lots of money is coming in. They're doing lots of good things. They're feeding people. And so many good things are going on. But this has really nothing to do with Bhagavan's teachings. So I hope, uh, whoever that anonymous was, I hope that's a, a satisfactory answer. As, as, as he says at the end, all this has nothing to do with mana nasa or surrendering ego to God. Exactly. So we take your pick. If you come to Ramanasham, we can worship Bhagavan as God. We can pray to Bhagavan for health, wealth, um, um, sons, daughters, whatever. We, we, we can pray to him for anything we want. But the wise thing to pray for is what he prayed for in Aranacha Stuti Panchkam, which is for the complete annihilation of ego. <laughs> Nothing but That's love for his feet. Wonderful answer to a relatively short question. I love yes. the history. But it's re the reason I chose this one, we were actually, very, this one had come last time, but I didn't answer it then. But since I'd answered this question about desirelessness, I thought this was a particularly uh, relevant question to answer. I agree with you completely, and I'm sure everybody else does too. It's the antithesis of desirelessness. We're well into our second hour, Michael. It's okay. time to take questions from the floor. Melissa, do you want to um, yes. Michael, what you uh, sent to me? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Hi, Michael. Thank you Hi. again for your continued support for this path. <clears throat> I, I'll read my question since I wrote it out. Um, in the past year, you had a very interesting discussion with Bernardo Castro, and there were some fundamental differences in how reality is to be understood. Bernardo promotes what he calls analytic idealism, which is actually a form of solipsism. In some recent videos of yours, you carefully pointed out how Ramana's description of reality is a metaphysical solipsism, but not a social solipsism. Yeah. And I feel that that I feel that I understand your important distinct distinction, yes. which is that while ego is still functioning, the first person and second person and third person are all equally real or unreal. Yes. So it is a form of lunacy to believe that my person is the only one in existence. Only when ego has ceased to function can the body and the mind and the world be seen clearly as entirely unreal mirages, seeming, only seeming to appear in the truly real, unborn and undying, pure awareness being, such it. I, I wonder if you could explore this a bit further for us. Yes. Um Thanks. Firstly, to be to be charitable to um, to Bernardo, his philosophy, his analytic idealism, does not um, 
that is, he is completely opposed to any form of solip solipsism. That was the problem. Um, because he wasn't understanding Bhagavan's teachings, and I didn't clarify it well enough, obviously. So, but um, his philosophy, he, his, he believes everything is mental. But, but it's not just my mind. There's, a, there's a, a universal mind, I think he calls it. I can't remember. And that all of this is, exists in that universal mind. But he gives certain analogies. For example, he says, we are like, we, we, we have no direct access to the external world. We're like a, a pilot sitting in a cockpit with no windows. All we have to guide us is various dials. And those dials indicate how the world is outside. And so based on those dials, we are, we, we, we're able to fly this plane. Um, that's the analogy he gives. But if, 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 we, if we take that analogy to its logical conclusion, if we have no access to the outside world, why should we believe that there's an outside world at all? That is, if all we know is the dials, that what he means by the dials is the sense information. But the sense information is not telling us how the world outside actually is. It's just right. giving us enough information so that we can navigate ourselves way through this world. Um, yes. But really, his, his own analogy gives room for the obvious question, how if if we are sitting in this cockpit and seeing only the dials and can't see anything outside except what the dials are telling us, how do we know there is anything outside? Those dials could be just like we, the, the same sensory information that we receive about the external world in waking. We receive the same sensory information about a seemingly external world in dream. And so long as we're dreaming, that seemingly external world seems to be perfectly real. But when we wake up, we realize it was all a mental fabrication. So what evidence do we have that this, our present state is anything but a mental fabrication? So his own philosophy, though he, he, he doesn't like the idea of solipsism at all, his own philosophy is opening the door to the possibility of solipsism. Yes, but anyway, exactly. but coming back to the main point of your question, the distinction between metaphysical solipsism and social solipsism. Social solipsism if, is if I think I'm the only person here, therefore I alone matter, no one else matters. That would be the, the, the outcome of social solipsism. That is not what Bhagavan taught us. So, so long as we are... Ex so long as we rise as ego, we experience ourselves as a body. So we seem to be a person in this world. And there, seem, there are so many other people just like us, like this person that we seem to be. So, so long as we seem to be knowing this world, it seems to us every other person is knowing this world. So because we as ego mistake ourselves to be a person, we mistake every other person to be an ego. So it seems to us that there's a multiplicity of egos. That's how it appears so long as we're looking outside. And we obviously we have to act in this world in accordance with the seeming reality of the world. Okay, this world is unreal. If we stop eating, what will happen? We'll get hungry. So but as, as Bhagavan said, in a dream, the dream hunger is satisfied by dream food. In other words, we have to, we have to act according to the seeming reality of the world and there's no wrong in doing so because we who are acting and the actions we do are all a part of this seeming world so they should all be we, 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 so long as we identify ourselves as a person in this world we should act in this world as if we are one among so many people the reason yeah. Bhagavan taught that there's only one ego is not to change our outward behavior, but to change our inner understanding. But all this appears only because I rise as ego. Therefore, the solution to solve all the problems in the world, the only way is to cease rising as ego. Every night when we fall asleep, we cease rising as ego, but that's only temporary. 
While we're sleeping, there are no problems at all. But when we wake up, all the problems come back again. So we want a state where we are eternally without rising as ego. <clears throat> and so in order to cease rising as ego permanently, we need to turn within and investigate ourselves. So all the many uh, egos or many jivas we see appear to whom? To me. So who is that me? Who am I? We need to turn our attention back within to investigate ourselves. So Bhagavan's teachings are all intended to make us turn our attention back towards ourselves to see what we actually are. So metaphysical solipsism, when we're trying to understand the reality of all this appearance, it all appears in the view of one ego. That is, now it seems to, it seems to us that there are so many egos, but to whom do, do all these semi egos exist? In the view of one ego. So who am I, this one ego? That, so the reason why one emphasizes the metaphysical solipsism is to make us turn within. It is not to change our attitude to the external world. But people not understanding this, they say, then if, uh, if there's only one ego, who is the ego? Is it me or you or this person or that person? Ego is not the person. They, they, they miss the point. The whole point of it is, so long as we're looking outwards, we have to behave as if there's a multiplicity of egos. And it seems to be so. And it, I mean, just like, just like hunger seems real to us, uh, what, so many things in this world seem, disease seems real to us, birth seems real to us, death seems real to us. So all the many, the many Jesus, they all seem real to us. But are they ultimately real? That is the question. And that's why, in order to answer that question, we need to know, we cannot know the truth of other things without knowing the truth of ourselves. We cannot know the truth of what is known without knowing the truth of the knower. So we are investigating ourselves, the knower, to find out our own reality. Then only we'll be able to pass judgment on the reality of all other things. Yes, that's very, very clear. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. I really appreciate it. And Michael, thank you too. Yeah. Amy's got her hand up first. Take it away. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to get this out. So to get to the question, I feel like I have to give you a little background. Sure. Make it a brief background, but make sure you get to the question, okay? Don't, don't be misled by me. Don't talk too much. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm at the most basic fundamentals, okay? Yes. And just recently, probably in the last few weeks, I've had the experience, it feels like at a deeper level of understanding there's this I that thinks it's Amy. Okay. Yeah. And at a deeper level where it made some kind of radical shift in my mind with the phenomena, like where I started going, oh, it's all made up. Oh. And then when that happened, what was left was the awareness of this is all thought. And maybe for the first time, I started to grasp, and this is the question, what you say that often confuses me is going back and holding on to that which is I. It has frustrated me. And I've been for five years trying to understand that very thing. But this moved me into, oh, so maybe now it's, holding on to the awareness yes. that is I and staying there. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. That, that is the thing is Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple, but it is, they're very simple, but very subtle. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, for many of us, it's very difficult to grasp what Bhagavan means. Once we grasp, then it becomes very, very clear, very, very simple. Mm -hmm. okay. That is, we can divide all experience, but the, the, the one essential ingredient in any experience is an experiencer. So the experiencer is I, the awareness. 
-hmm. And whatever else is, everything else is what is experienced. Things that are experienced are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. But the the experience always remains the same. Well, so let me ask However, okay, no, you say. Well, it's not, so when I had that experience, I mean, it was a full body sense of relief. Yes. But it wasn't I, and that's what I moved into, which now I have a trace memory of. But it doesn't feel like a clear sense of I am. It doesn't, it feels like still the ego has a sense yeah, of. Right, but, right. I, 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 this is what I, the point I was going to make. That okay. is, relative to all other things, ego, the experience of a knower, the awareness that knows all these things, is relatively permanent. But ego is not the ultimate reality because ego itself appears and disappears. That is, ego is constant throughout waking and dream. And all Mm -hmm. the things that ego is experiencing are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So our our, um, waking and dream states they're what is sometimes referred to as, um, what is it? Um, the flow of consciousness or something they say, stream of consciousness or something. What, they, what is meant by stream of consciousness is, is not consciousness that is a stream. What is experienced by consciousness is a stream or flow. That is, if you think of the waking and dream state, from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to back to sleep at night, so many things we're experiencing. We're experiencing thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, and constantly changing. Likewise in dream, from the moment we begin dreaming to the moment we cease dreaming, it's a constant, constant flow of changing experiences. But in both of these states, the experiencer is the same. The experiencer is I, that which is aware of all these things, that is ego. But that experiencer disappears along with all its experiences in sleep. Mm-hmm. So there's no, this, this ego is absent in sleep, but we are not absent there. Because we experience the state, we, we, we are aware of having been in a state where we were not aware of anything else. That means there is an underlying awareness that continues in all these three states. That Mm -hmm. is, it is I who am now awake. It was I who was dreaming. It was I who was asleep. So it's the same I, but there's a difference between the I as it was in sleep and the I as it seems to be now in waking or dream. Because now that that I is aware of itself as I am Amy, I am Michael, I am whoever, there's an identification. In sleep, that is the pure I am. So that same pure I am that exists alone in sleep exists even now, but it's seemingly mixed and conflated with adjuncts as I am Amy. Mm -hmm. So the real, the I... The I that is aware of itself as I am Amy Mm -hmm. is not other than the real I, but it is it is it it is not the real I. It's not the real I that experiences itself as I am Amy. There's some some other seeming I that is aware of itself as I am Amy. So but by investigating that I that is now aware of itself as I am Amy, because I am Amy is a is a compound awareness. It consists of two elements, I am and Amy. These two are conflated. Take, they seem to be one. This is what is called Chit Jada Granti. Chit is the awareness I am. Jada means what is not aware. That, that is the, 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 the person called Amy. These two are mixed and conflated. Mm-hmm. So in this ego, there is a real element and an unreal element. That is, ego is unreal, but it's not entirely unreal because it's got an element of reality in it. The element of reality in ego is that fundamental awareness I am. 
That is the same awareness that continues in sleep. Mm -hmm. In the well, absence like, of ego. But well, this, that I am that was there in a pure condition in sleep is there even now, but now it's seemingly mixed with adjuncts as I am Amy. Mm -hmm. Well, can I? Yes. Can I yes, okay. sure. So where I'm stuck, I'll use that word, is when you were saying that Amy and the the I am are conflated. Yes. Where when I when you say turn back to that which is bright bright and shiny and hold on to that, I yes. I don't know where to except for just that awareness that I had a glimpse of in these last few weeks of, oh, this is all phenomena, all of it. Yes. Every little, little thing. Yes. Um, that just, but it's, but it's just an awareness of that's just thought. <laughs> it's, this yes. is, yeah, that yeah. Is phenomena of what appears, but nothing can appear without appearing to something. So there has to be an awareness to which phenomena appear. Mm. So what is that awareness to which phenomena appear? That is the I which is aware of itself as I am Amy. That is not the pure I. In the view of the pure I, there are no phenomena. That's why when, when the false awareness I am Amy dissolves in sleep and the pure I alone remains, there are no phenomena. Mm -hmm. Only when this false I rises again, grasps itself, grasps this person Amy, and, so, and is aware of itself as I am Amy, and then it becomes aware of all these other things. Mm. Mm. Okay. Maybe we're going to move on now. Okay. We, okay. we shouldn't move on. This is the, we now come to a point. We, we let go of Amy, we let go of Ted, we let go of Michael, whatever we identify ourselves with, and hold on to the I am. That is, so we've now come to the essential point. From this point, we shouldn't move anywhere. The trouble is our minds are still out. We're going to again, we come out again. But we, we've now arrived at the point, at least by in this discussion, at least in our understanding, we've arrived at the point where we should rest and remain, holding on to this pure I am. Okay, I'm getting that. I'm getting that. Right. Where be anything right. casts its web, it's right here. It's you yeah, just... Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Bring more questions back next week if you want to. We're going to try to get to as many people as possible. Yeah. Great but that was a very useful set of questions. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bernath, you've been there waiting patiently and sent in a couple of questions, which we were going to be getting to. Uh, but it sounds like maybe you have something different to say now. Go ahead. It's your turn. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, actually, it's the same couple of questions I had sent in, so I don't know if uh, yeah, I could yeah, go ahead and ask them. Sure, exactly. go ahead. Is that all right with you, Michael? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Go Thank ahead. you so yeah. much, Michael. Uh, really grateful to, to yeah. interact with you and learn more. Um, so the one question I had uh, was very similar to Amy's, and I'm also very new to the self-inquiry. Yeah. Um, so I understand when I question, who am I? Um, and this, at, at the end of the day, like you mentioned, the state that the Saga Janalai, that I exist right now, this very instant, is what I get to. But by questioning, uh, all the adjuncts drop off, and I realize I am this uh, at the end of the day. And that's, uh, is that a state of timelessness? Because I am here right now, whereas all the adjuncts are, there is a frame of reference and there is an association with the material or the matter or the body and therefore is bound by time. Uh, is that a way of looking at it? Because also in sleep and in the Saga Janalai, there is no concept of time. Exactly, exactly. Time, mm -hmm. time is time and space and all other phenomena appear only when we rise as ego. And whenever we rise as ego, we always attach ourselves to a set of adjuncts. We always experience ourselves as I am this body, I am this person, I am Bharat. Mm -hmm. So in waking a dream, you're aware of yourself as I am Bharat. In mm -hmm. sleep, you're aware of yourself just as I am. So in the absence of 
these adjuncts, but uh, but form, but together with I am form ego, in the absence of the adjuncts, that means in the absence of ego, there's no time, no space, nothing. There's just the pure such it. Excellent. Okay. In in that case, then why? Uh, I mean, I, I feel you can get to the state of me just being in this very, very instant, instead of doing the self inquiry where you're caught up in a web of adjuncts, and ultimately it leads to the same state. Um, in, is that the in, in self inquiry, you're not caught up in a web of adjuncts. Self inquiry is not asking who am I? That is so. Atma vichara means self investigation. Bhagavan didn't say ask. It is recorded in many English books, the Bhagavan said, ask who am I, but that is not a correct uh, translation of what Bhagavan said. Bhagavan said, investigate who am I. Every investigation begins with a, a question. For example, um, a police investigation begins with the question, who is the criminal? Who committed this crime? But the police cannot solve that investigation, they, can, they, they cannot find the answer to that question without investigating. They have to go out, they have to look for evidence, they have to, um, they have to question, uh, um, the, well, they, they interrogate the, um, the uh, witnesses, they, um, or they interview the witnesses, they interrogate the suspects, and so on and so forth, but they're also looking for evidence and so on. This is the actual investigation. But that investigation began with the question, who is the criminal? Who committed the crime? But if the police just sit in the police station saying, who committed the crime? Who committed the crime? They're not going to get anywhere. So this investigation, who am I? Who am I is the starting point. But it is not the investigation. It is, it is telling us what we have to investigate. We are seeking to know what we actually are. So um, it's the same with a scientific investigation. If, um, if, if scientists, scientists, they start off with a question. They, they, they seek the answer of a question, but they don't just ask the question. In order to find the answer, they have to actually go out there, they have to observe, they have to do experiments. And finally, they, if their investigation is successful, they arrive at least at a tentative answer. But science is always evolving. So what is, seems a correct answer one day, next generation that will seem to be the wrong answer and a better, more refined answer. That's science. But in this path, we... What we are seeking to know is who am I or what am I? But merely asking the question is not going to... Of course, we need, there needs to be a certain amount of um, rational analysis. We need to understand what we are not. Because if we are told to attend to ourselves and we take ourselves to be this body, then we can sit in front of a mirror looking at ourselves. But that's not self-investigation. So we first need to understand what we are not. We are not this body or mind or any of these. We are not any of these adjuncts. We are just that fundamental awareness of being. Once we've understood that, then how do we investigate that? There's a, the only, there are no witnesses we can call. There are no, um, no suspects to interrogate. The only way to investigate who am I is to attend to ourselves. That's why Bhagavan defines what he means by Atma Vichara in Nana, in the 16th paragraph, he says, um, uh, Sada Kalamum Manate Atma Vilve Tirupadakutan Atma Vichara Mendrupaya. That means the name Atma Vichara is only for always keeping the mind on oneself. Keeping the mind on oneself means keeping our attention on ourselves. So what he implies in that sentence is that merely at, just attending to ourselves, that alone is self-investigation. So all the, the what in, in, uh, in classical Advaita are called prakriyas, all the different um, trictrisi of Ivaka, distinguishing the, the seer from the scene, the analysis of the three states, the um, distinguishing the 
what is changing from what is unchanging, all these different ways of arriving at the understanding, but I'm not any of these phenomena. That is this body, this, uh, uh, all the five she's, the panchakoshas, the, the, the physical form of the body, the prana, the, 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 the physiological functions that, uh, uh, well, the prana manifests as physiological functions in the body, the breathing and so on, um, the mind, the intellect and the will, all these are things known by us. That is, our, the will consists of the vasanas, or in the grosser form with likes and dislikes, desires and so on. These are all things known by us. The workings of the intellect are known by us. The, the, the workings of the mind, the perceptions, memories, thoughts, feelings and so on, these are all known, things known by us. They're all things that appear and disappear. So they're all objects, all phenomena. But we who know all these things are the subject. So we have to bring our attention back, away from all phenomena, back towards the subject. But the subject is ego. That I that is uh, identified with a certain set of phenomena, namely these five sheaths, that, uh, the, the person we take ourselves to be. But what we are investigating because the ego is this mixed awareness, I am Bharat, that, that which is aware of itself as I am Bharat, that is ego. But what we are investigating is only the, that fundamental awareness, I am. Makes sense, makes sense. I'm, I'm also intrigued uh, if the Sagat and Eli were to be the true state, what does the nature of the awareness states of uh, two beings, one who is realized and one who is not realized after they leave their material bodies. So okay. are they eventually realized? Then if that's the case, what's the significance of realization while having a body? Um, the, the two beings exist only in the view of the one who is not self-realized. If you are, if you are, um, the one who is, for the one who is realized, all that exists is pure awareness. In your question, when you, the written question, you said, after they leave their material bodies, the truth is, the realized one, the jnani, has already left the physical body. Bhagavan left the physical body on that day in, um, in uh, July uh, 1896, when he had that fear of death and he turned within, at that moment he was permanently separated from the body. But in our view, that body lived for another 54 years, and we have the story of Bhagavan's life and we have got his teachings and everything. But that's only in our view. Bhagavan often said, because you mistake yourself to be the body, you take the jnani to be the body. But for the jnani, there's no body or world or anything. Jnana, jnani means what knows jnana. What is jnana? Jnana is pure awareness. What knows pure awareness is only pure awareness. So Bhagavan often used to say, jnana me jnani. That means jnana alone is the jnani. So jnana is that state of pure awareness. Pure awareness means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. So that is the Sahaja Nilay, that's the state of, of, our, um, of Sahaja, of the Sahaja city. But for the Agnani, we are now attached to this body. When this body dies, e that is not the death of ego. So at the time of death of the body, one of two things can happen. Either we fall asleep, temporarily, or we continue dreaming. So people who report uh, near-death experiences, it seems in their case, though the body had died, they continue dreaming. So they, they may have, uh, some people dream of going to heaven and seeing the pearly gates or whatever, and um, other people have also, I mean, people have different experiences. Um, in most cases, but not all cases, people come back with um, reporting pleasant experiences in after death but some for some people it's not so but generally it seems to they seem to come back experiencing 
but whether you continue dreaming or you or you fall asleep if you continue dreaming it will only be for a while sooner or later you'll fall asleep you'll slowly forget all this previous life and sooner or later another dream will start you you and it will start off with you experiencing yourself as a small baby and then growing up going through all the the um the the um the joys and sorrows of childhood and then joys and sorrow of teenagehood and then joys and sorrow of adulthood of all this life and then the joys and sorrows growing old and eventually dying and it goes on and on and on and on so the the, the difference is the, the difference between these two states is for the jnani, ego is finished, completely finished, forever. In fact, in the view of the jnani, ego never existed at all. Whereas for the agnani, the mere death of a body, like Krishna says in the Gita, is just like changing a shirt. It's, 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 a, it's a very... For us, de because we are so attached to this body, death seems to us to be a very big deal. But we've died so many times before. We've been born and died so many times before. And it'll continue until we become aware of ourselves as we actually are. And to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to turn our attention within. Sorry. And, and, and the jnani would still always be a jnani, if, uh, even if he embodies himself. Not will always be a jnani, is always he's, a jnani, he's always eternally, jnani. Okay. Mm. eternally, yeah. in the past, present and future. Yeah. Because when, when ego is destroyed, it's not, oh, I've newly attained jnana. That's not the experience. I am eternally nothing but jnana itself. Jnana is Thank our you. real nature. It's what we always actually are. And that alone will remain. Bra, thank you. I'm glad we got both your questions in today, after all. And Michael, thank you. I think I was asleep during the classroom session one day when I was presumably taught and didn't hear that ego remains for those who aren't awakened after the body dies. Uh, that's quite enlightening for me, and I really appreciate it. For those who you... aren't awakened. Yeah. Well, Pardon? when you say for those, ego isn't, that is... It is ego that is the one that is not awakened. It is ego who goes on from one life to another. Ego is the dreamer. Right. So when yeah, one dream identity comes to an end, we dream ourselves to be someone else. Only ego Now you're dreaming yourself me. to be Ted. Yeah. If you don't know who you are before the death of Ted, then you'll dream yourself to be Tom or... Uh, Tim or uh, some other X, Y, or Z. Well, I'm pretty much done with being Ted. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all we, are. We as we get older, we, 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 we... Tomorrow I'll be one year from 80, so I'm pretty much done in more ways than Oh, right, one. right, right. <laughs> this guy, Ted. He's, yeah. he's, it's time for him to go. Thank yeah. you very much, and, um, and Sri Ram, you're waiting in the wings there. Usually I would call it to an end right now, but if you can get your question in, we've got seven minutes left, okay? Yes, sir. It's a short question. Michael, it's awesome. Love everything you do in your writings and teaching. I esteem and grateful. Help me understand how to use a jnana mantra. You talked about bhakti mantra and jnana mantra a session ago. Sometimes the mind, it's hard to keep the mind on the self, just inquiring, as you have talked many times, as the final method. You have recommended it as a as a technique of using jnana mantra, I I leading to the self. Should one attend to the source where this mantra sound arises while using the jnana mantra? Is that the right technique? And when would you deploy it and how? Supposing you're you're doing japa of a name of God. Supposing you're doing japa of Ram 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 Ram. What is your mind on? Is your mind just on that name, Ram, or is it on what that name refers to? It's on the symbolism what the name represents. Yes, yes. It, it's, it's that, that beloved um, avatar who was uh, so righteous and uh, so lovable. That is... Uh, so we love the name Ram 
because we love the person whose name it is. Or not even person, he's beyond, we can't even say he's a person, he's God himself. Like, likewise, when we, when we repeat, when, if we take I, if we repeat I, our attention should not be just on the word I, but what the word I refers to. That is, Bhagavan sometimes, not all, he didn't always recommend this, but sometimes in certain contexts, he recommended just doing japa of I. But the aim, he made it clear that the aim of doing japa of I is to help us to keep our attention fixed on that which the word I refers to, namely our own being, our own fundamental awareness. Or being such it. So uh, doing japa would be very incomplete if we just focus on the name. We, we because the when we do when we do japa of the name of God, we are doing it to um, express our love for God. So that name is a way of focusing our mind on the God we, we love. Bhagavan said the first and foremost name of God is I. He said even Om is second to I. He sometimes said uh, that um, I is the Anna, the elder brother, and uh, Om is Tambi, the younger brother. So the, the first name of God is I. That is the natural name of God, because God is most intimately and directly present within the heart of each one of us as that which the word I refers to, namely our own being. So repeating the word I is, in, is useful to the extent to which it um, focuses our attention on what the word I refers to, namely ourself, our own being. Is that clear? That's very clear. And we have to be careful not to attach any qualities to that being, like full of bliss or full of compassion or full of Don't anger. think anything. It think only of I, of what, what the word I refers to. Thank you very much. The year is winding down, but then what do we care? It's illusory anyway. Yeah. Uh, we're going to continue the on. The year is winding down and we are also winding down. <laughs> we are also one ego. Most of us yeah. have reached the stage of life where we are winding down or getting very close to winding down. <laughs> so, so I am one with all the people I'm favorably impressed by, but I'm also one with those I'm not favorably impressed by. So I better use my uh, time remaining to correct that part of ego. Uh, yeah leads to the realization of who we are, the oneness. 